Welcome back. I'm Logan, your host for the Daily Bible Reading Podcast, where we are journeying through the Bible chronologically, taking it one day at a time. Hello, friends. Today is day number 139, and we are looking at 2 Samuel chapter 19 to 21 today, back in the story of King David. When we left him a few days ago, he was in grief over the loss of his son. Mind you, his son had gone to war with him, trying to take over his throne, but he still lost his son nevertheless, and he is mourning and grieving the loss of his son. We're going to pick up there in 2 Samuel chapter 19 and carry us through chapter 21. But before we get started, let's pray and ask that God would allow his word as we read it to not just be seen as entertainment or a good story, but that he would use it to shape us and mold us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Our unreached people group for today are the Hue in Kyrgyzstan. The Hue are a Chinese people but we're specifically looking at the around 2,000 or so that are located away from their home country in Kyrgyzstan. There's an old Chinese proverb that states, a Chinese awake is not the equal of a Hue sleeping. The Hue are known as astute business persons, and they live across the nation of China and in seven other countries in Asia and the Middle East. The Hue are almost all Sunni Muslims, and as Muslims, they have sometimes endured persecution in China. Most Hue today make their living in trade, whether it be in business, banking, commerce, agriculture, or the like. These Chinese Hue believers who went to Kyrgyzstan, many of them went to form business partnerships with them. And there are many resources available in Mandarin Chinese, which is their primary language. But as far as we know, among these 2,000 Hue in Kyrgyzstan, there are no believers known. And so we pray that God would soon open doors for these Christian materials to reach the Hue communities. We ask that God would mobilize the church in Kyrgyzstan toward reaching these Hue people with the goal of bringing about a disciple-making movement amongst themselves. And God, now as we come to this time of opening up your word and beholding truth within its pages, God, we pray that you would help us to set aside all of the distractions that we have in front of us, whether it be the business that's about us or our families or uh, the you know, food that's cooking on the stove, whatever it might be. Lord, I pray that you would supernaturally give us a focus so that we may hear your word and that we may apply it to our lives and understand exactly what it is that you would have us hear as we look at your word. Help us to understand it well, but not just understand the words on the page in a intellectual sense but understand what truth you would have for us to apply to our lives that's found within it. What principles that are buried deep inside these passages that you would have us apply to our lives. God, I pray that you would help to unite our heart to fear your name, to not have any idols that are lingering in our hearts that our allegiance would go after, but that you and you alone would be our God, and that we would fear you and love you at the same time, that you would transform us more into the image of your Son, and that we would be satisfied deeply within you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. All right, it's time to get started. I've got my Bible out and ready to go. I've got my drink here in case I get a little parched. Hope you're following along with me at home. Let's read. 2 Samuel chapter 19 It was told Joab, Behold, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. So the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people. For the people heard that day, The king is grieving for his son. And the people stole into the city that day, as people steal in who are ashamed when they flee in battle. The king covered his face, and the king cried with a loud voice, O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. 
Then Joab came into the house to the king and said, You have today covered with shame the faces of all your servants, who have this day saved your life and the lives of your sons and your daughters and the lives of your wives and your concubines, because you love those who hate you and hate those who love you. For you have made it clear today that commanders and servants are nothing to you. For today I know that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead today, then you would be pleased. Now therefore, arise, go out and speak kindly to your servants. For I swear by the Lord, if you do not go, not a man will stay with you this night. And this will be worse for you than all the evil that has come upon you from your youth until now. Then the king arose and took his seat in the gate. And the people were all told, Behold, the king is sitting in the gate. And all the people came before the king. Now Israel had fled, every man to his home. And all the people were arguing throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, The king delivered us from the hand of our enemies, and saved us from the hand of the Philistines. And now he has fled out of the land from Absalom. But Absalom, who we anointed over us, is dead in battle. Now therefore, why do you say nothing about bringing the king back? And King David sent this message to Zadok and Abiathar the priests. Say to the elders of Judah, why should you be the last to bring the king back to his house, when the word of all Israel has come to the king? You are my brothers. You are my bone and my flesh. Why then should you be the last to bring back the king? And say to Amasa, Are you not my bone and my flesh? God do so to me and more also, if you are not commander of my army from now on, in place of Joab. And he swayed the heart of all the men of Judah as one man, so that they sent word to the king, Return, both you and all your servants. So the king came back to the Jordan, and Judah came to Gilgal to meet the king, and to bring the king over the Jordan. And Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjaminite, from Bahurim, hurried to come down with the men of Judah to meet King David. And with him were a thousand men from Benjamin. And Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, with his fifteen sons and his twenty servants, rushed down to the Jordan before the king. And they crossed the ford to bring over the king's household, and to do his pleasure. And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king, as he was about to cross the Jordan, and said to the king, Let not my lord hold me guilty, or remember how your servant did wrong, on the day my lord the king left Jerusalem. Do not let the king take it to heart, for your servant knows that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I have come this day, the first of all the house of Joseph, to come down to meet my lord the king. Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, answered, Shall not Shimei be put to death for this, because he cursed the Lord's anointed? But David said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah, that you should this day be as an adversary to me? Shall any one be put to death in Israel this day? For do I not know that I am this day king over Israel? And the king said to Shimei, You shall not die. And the king gave him his oath. And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. He had neither taken care of his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came back in safety. And when he came to Jerusalem to meet the king, the king said to him, Why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? He answered, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me, for your servant said to him, I will saddle a donkey for myself, that I may ride on it and go with the king, for your servant is lame. He has slandered your servant to my lord the king, but my lord the king is like the angel of God. Do therefore what seems good to you, for all my father's house were but men doomed to death before my lord the king, but you set your servant among those who eat at your table. What further right have I then to cry to the king? And the king said to him, Why speak any more of your affairs? I have decided, you and Ziba shall divide the land. And Mephibosheth said to the king, Oh, let him take it all, since my lord the king has come home safely. Now Barzillai the Gileadite had come down from Rogalim, and he went on with the king to the Jordan, to escort him over the Jordan. Barzillai was a very aged man, eighty years old. He had provided the king with food while he stayed at Mahanaim, for he was a very wealthy man. And the king said to Barzillai, 
Come over with me, and I will provide for you with me in Jerusalem. But Barzillai said to the king, How many years have I still to live, that I should go up with the king to Jerusalem? I am this day eighty years old. Can I discern what is pleasant and what is not? Can your servant taste what he eats or what he drinks? Can I still listen to the voice of singing men and singing women? Why then should your servant be an added burden to my lord the king? Your servant will go a little way over the Jordan with the king. Why should the king repay me with such a reward? Please let your servant return, that I may die in my own city, near the grave of my father and my mother. But here is your servant Chimham. Let him go over with my lord the king, and do for him whatever seems good to you. And the king answered, Chimham shall go over with me, and I will do for him whatever seems good to you, and all that you desire of me I will do for you. Then all the people went over the Jordan, and the king went over, and the king kissed Barzillai and blessed him, and he returned to his own home. The king went on to Gilgal, and Chimham went on with him. All the people of Judah, and also half the people of Israel, brought the king on his way. Then all the men of Israel came to the king, and said to the king, Why have our brothers, the men of Judah, stolen you away, and brought the king and his household over the Jordan, and all David's men with him? All the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, Because the king is our close relative. Why then are you angry over this matter? Have we eaten at all at the king's expense, or has he given us any gift? And the men of Israel answered the men of Judah, We have ten shares in the king, and in David also we have more than you. Why then did you despise us? Were we not the first to speak of bringing back our king? But the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. Chapter 20 Now there happened to be there a worthless man, whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjaminite. And he blew the trumpet and said, We have no portion in David, and we have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tent, O Israel. So all the men of Israel withdrew from David, and followed Sheba the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah followed their king steadfastly from the Jordan to Jerusalem. And David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took the ten concubines, whom he had left to care for the house, and put them in a house under guard, and provided for them, but did not go in to them. So they were shut up until the day of their death, living as if in widowhood. Then the king said to Amasa, Call the men of Judah together to me within three days, and be here yourself. So Amasa went to summon Judah, but he delayed beyond the set time that had been appointed him. And David said to Abishai, Now Sheba the son of Bichri will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your lord's servants and pursue him, lest he get himself into fortified cities and escape from us. And there went out after him Joab's men, and the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and all the mighty men. They went out from Jerusalem to pursue Sheba the son of Bichri. When they were at the great stone that is in Gibeon, Amasa came to meet them. Now Joab was wearing a soldier's garment, and over it was a belt with a sword in its sheath fastened on his thigh. And as he went forward it fell out. And Joab said to Amasa, Is it well with you, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. But Amasa did not observe the sword that was in Joab's hand. So Joab struck him with it in the stomach, and spilled his entrails to the ground, without striking a second blow. And he died. Then Joab and Abishai his brother pursued Sheba the son of Bichri, and one of Joab's young men took his stand by Amasa, and said, Whoever favors Joab, and whoever is for David, let him follow Joab. And Amasa lay wallowing in his blood in the highway, and any one who came by seeing him stopped. And when the man saw that all the people stopped, he carried Amasa out of the highway into the field, and threw a garment over him. When he was taken out of the highway, all the people went on after Joab to pursue Sheba, the sons of Bichri. And Sheba passed through all the tribes of Israel to Abel of Beth Makkah. And all the Beechrites assembled and followed him in. And all the men who were with Joab came and besieged him in Abel of Beth Makkah. They cast up a mound against the city, and it stood against the rampart. And they were battering the wall to throw it down. Then a wise woman called from the city, Listen, listen, tell Joab, come here that I may speak to you. And he came near her, and the woman said, Are you Joab? He answered, I am. 
Then she said to him, Listen to the words of your servant. And he answered, I am listening. Then she said, They used to say in former times, Let them but ask counsel at Abel. And so they settled a matter. I am one of those who are peaceable and faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city that is a mother in Israel. Why will you swallow up the heritage of the Lord? Joab answered, Far be it from me, far be it, that I should swallow up or destroy. That is not true. But a man of the hill country of Ephraim, called Sheba, the son of Betri, has lifted up his hand against King David. Give up him alone, and I will withdraw from the city. And the woman said to Joab, Behold, his head shall be thrown to you over the wall. Then the woman went to all the people in her wisdom, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Betri, and threw it out to Joab. So he blew his trumpet, and they dispersed from the city, every man to his home, and Joab returned to Jerusalem to the king. Now Joab was in command of all the army of Israel, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada was in command of the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and Adoram was in charge of the forced labor, and Jehoshaphat the son of Ahilud was the recorder, and Shiva was secretary, and Zadok and Abiathar were priests, and Ira the Jairite was also David's priest. Chapter 21 Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year, and David sought the face of the Lord. And the Lord said, There is blood guilt on Saul and on his house, because he put the Gibeonites to death. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the people of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. Although the people of Israel had sworn to spare them, Saul had sought to strike them down in his zeal for the people of Israel and Judah. And David said to the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you, and how shall I make atonement, that you may bless the heritage of the Lord? The Gibeonites said to him, It is not a matter of silver or gold between us and Saul or his house, neither is it for us to put any man to death in Israel. And he said, What do you say that I shall do for you? They said to the king, The man who consumed us and planned to destroy us, so that we should have no place in all the territory of Israel, let seven of his sons be given to us, so that we may hang them before the Lord at Gibeah of Saul, the chosen of the Lord. And the king said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Saul's son Jonathan, because of the oath of the Lord which was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. The king took the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, whom she bore to Saul, Armoni and Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Merab, the daughter of Saul, whom she bore to Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Maholathite. And he gave them into the hands of the Gideonites, and they hanged them on the mountain before the Lord. And the seven of them perished together. They were put to death in the first days of harvest, at the beginning of barley harvest. Then Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock from the beginning of harvest until rain fell upon them from the heavens. And she did not allow the birds of the air to come upon them by day, or the beasts of the field at night. When David was told what Rizpah the daughter of Aiah, the concubine of Saul, had done, David went out and took the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan from the men of Jabesh-Gilead, who had stolen them from the public square of beth where the Philistines had hanged them, on the day the Philistines killed Saul on Gilboa. And he brought up from there the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan. And they gathered the bones of those who were hanged. And they buried the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan in the land of Benjamin in Zela, in the tomb of Kish his father. They did all that the king commanded, and after that God responded to the plea for the land. There was war again between the Philistines and Israel, and David went down together with his servants, and they fought against the Philistines, and David grew weary. And Ishbi Benob, one of the descendants of the giants, whose spear weighed three hundred shekels of bronze, and who was armed with a new sword, thought to kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid and attacked the Philistine and killed him. Then David's men swore to him, You shall no longer go out with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. After this there was again war with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibachai, the Hushathite, struck down Saph, who was one of the descendants of the giants. And there was again war with the Philistines at Gob. And Elhanan, the son of Jari-Origim, the Bethlehemite, 
struck down Goliath, the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was again war at Gath, where there was a man of great stature, who had six fingers on each hand, and six toes on each foot, twenty-four in number. And he also was descended from the giants. And when he taunted Israel, Jonathan the son of Shemai, David's brother, struck him down. These four were descended from the giants in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. If you're looking for encouragement for life's journey, a better understanding of the Bible, or an honest look at Scripture, check out the Christ-Centered Journey. I'm your host, Dan Shipton, and I'd like to invite you to check us out. Mondays through Fridays, we air new programs. It's a daily podcast that's built around building one another up as Christ followers in this journey we call life. So why don't you join us by looking us up on your podcasting host for the Christ-Centered Journey. David is 60 years old today in our reading. He has 10 years left to go on his life. We are on the downhill side of his life, and when we saw him last, there were 20,000 casualties in the battle between Absalom's forces and David's. There was some good news, and there was some bad news as we closed. The good news, David's forces won the war. The bad news, Absalom, his son, lost his life in the battle. Now we left David in Mahanaim. David's on the east side of the Jordan River, about 30 or 40 miles north uh, of the point to cross the Jordan. And we're getting ready to return. But David is still mourning so badly. Everything has stopped dead in its tracks. Have you ever been there? That kind of feeling like it's not worth it to go on? You can't take another trial and then sure enough, here comes another one? Why this? Why me? Why now? God, are you there? Do you really care? That's where David is in today's reading. And this is a long reading, and I'm going to focus mainly on what happens in chapter 19. There is a lot that happens here, and it serves as a dividing line in the life of David. This chapter begins his restoration to the throne and this last phase of his life. Again, he lives only 10 more years after the death of Absalom. So David is in deep grief for Absalom. Remember after Bathsheba when the other son of his died. His reaction then was that he prayed for the baby while the baby was alive, but when he died, he got up, he put on clean clothes, he washed his face, and he went to worship. This time is different. And I think the reason is because with the baby, David made the statement that nothing he could do would bring the baby back, but he would go to be with him someday. I think that meant that he had confidence that God would save this little innocent baby and he would see him in heaven. But maybe David wasn't sure where Absalom was. He never spent enough time to really know his son. And Absalom seemed to be so evil. I think David may have mourned so much here because he didn't know whether Absalom was a child of God or not. So David is a very broken man. He's lost everything. His throne, he'd been driven out of his beloved Jerusalem, Zion. As a reminder, this was all a consequence of his sin. It finally got to be just too much for him, and he couldn't pull himself out of his despair. Well, Joab is told that the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. And I'm sure that in his heart of hearts, he must have felt some guilt over disobeying the king's clear command to be kind to Absalom. But the fact is that he was the one who executed Absalom. David's mourning is affecting everyone else too. It should have been a day of great victory for the army, but instead it's turned into a time of national mourning. In verse 3, we see that the men stole into the city that day as men steal in who are ashamed when they flee from battle. What's David doing with his grief? It's destroying the morale and the loyalty of his men, and that's going to be devastating for them if he doesn't do something about it. Joab is going to end up confronting him with it. In verse 5, we see that Joab went into the house of the king and said, Today you have humiliated all your men who have just saved your life and the lives of your sons and daughters and your wives and concubines. 
Joab has some stern and courageous talking with the king at this point, and he levels the charge by saying, Today you have humiliated all your men. Here, Joab helps David through his grief and helps him get back on target. It took some bravery and some love. In Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6, we see, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Joab says, It looks like you would have been happy if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead. Tell you what, if you keep acting like this, everyone, including me, is going to desert you. Now, David, is that really how you feel, or are you just going to let your grief keep going on? Now, another king might have commanded that Joab's head be cut off, but Joab has been a faithful advisor and a friend, even if he has been and will continue to be brash and violent. And David is listening to his wisdom, even though he's not happy with Joab. Now, we're not sure if he knows Joab's role in Absalom's death at this point, but he certainly is going to find out about it sooner or later. So the king gets up, he washes his face, and he heads out to the gate so that the people can come out to see him and so he can express his thanks to them for fighting on his behalf. As we move on in the story, I want you to get this picture in your mind. Whenever you see the term Israel, we're referring to the ten tribes in the north. When you refer to Judah, it's the tribe of Judah and Simeon in the south. Judah is David's home tribe. Well, after the war is over, the folks up in the north in Israel start talking about bringing David back as their king, since, you know, Absalom's plan didn't pan out. But David doesn't immediately march back to Jerusalem because he preferred to wait wait until he had been invited back to the throne from which he had been driven. David has learned a great lesson in his life. When you hurry and take matters into your own hands, you always harm and hamper God's ultimate purpose for your life. When you are most eager to act, that's when you make the dumbest mistakes. Just wait. Time is on your side. Don't hurry, whether it's disciplining your kids or making some major decision with regard to your business or work or whatever. Stop and think of the times when you were under stress and when you made a whole bunch of decisions at once. Most of them, I bet, were probably made in the flesh, and they were wrong. So David sends a message now to the priests of the tribe of Judah. He sends it to Zadok and Abiathar, the priests, and he asks them, Why haven't I heard anything from you guys? I'm sure not going to come back without you all being involved in this. This would be like winning an election, but losing your home state. Everyone but Judah had declared themselves and their desire for David to return to the throne. Maybe they were afraid because they had been forefront in Absalom's rebellion. So he essentially asks, do you want me to come home? And then he makes a bargain that seems foolish to make peace. You remember Amasa, the commander of Absalom's army? Well, David gives him the role of the commander of the army instead of Joab. Amasa led the rebellion's forces. He's got a track record of one loss and no victories. Meanwhile, Joab had a string of victories over 30 years. Joab is a seasoned military genius and he just gave back the king the kingdom. So why is David doing this? Well, I'm willing to bet that it's because he just found out that Joab threw the spears that killed his son. This also helps to prevent Amasa from organizing his own rebellion, but Joab can't be happy with this. The plan does work, however, and Judah welcomes him home, so he heads back to the Jordan to cross over, and he's welcomed by some familiar but unexpected people. And here we see David shine in his leadership. I'm sure there were many critics out there that would have done things differently. However, this is where I see the character and the heart of God in the life of David. Here we see one of the best illustrations of the power of forgiveness and the ability to forgive. Now, there are three types of forgiveness that fall short of the kind of forgiveness that we see described here in the Bible. You know, first of all, there's conditional forgiveness. You know, I'll forgive you, but you better straighten up or don't make another false move or else I'll retract my forgiveness. 
Then there's partial forgiveness that says, I forgive you, but don't think I'll ever forget it. And there's not a lot of comfort in that kind of forgiveness. Then the third kind is delayed forgiveness. Oh, I'll forgive you, but I simply hurt too much now to do it. Just give me some space. I'm going to do it, but I need some time to heal. All of those types of forgiveness fall short. God expects of us that we forgive, we forget, and that we free the offender. You forgive them, you forget what they did, and you free them to go on into the future. And that's not easy. But that's exactly what we see David do here with the first person who comes looking for forgiveness, Shimei. You probably remember Shimei. He was the relative of Saul that we saw last cursing David and throwing rocks as he was leaving the city. He comes with a threefold request of the king that looks a lot like the confession that we make before God when we seek salvation. He says, Lord, don't hold me guilty. In other words, he says, forgive me. Second, he says, Lord, don't remember it. Or, please don't continue to judge me into the future because of my actions. In other words, forget my sin. And he says, Lord, put it out of your mind. Do it quickly, do it fully, and free me for the future. Those are exactly the things that we get from God. He forgives us in Christ. He puts our sin as far as the east is from the west, and he gives us freedom in Christ to walk in righteousness from this day forward. If you're a Christian and you're still wrestling with sins that you committed in the past, get over it. God has. Walk in newness of life. You know who makes a good forgiver? It's a person who's been forgiven. Next, we see Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson, and what a contrast he is to Shimei. He loved David like his father Jonathan loved him, and in this passage, he really proves his loyalty and his devotion. Apparently, Ziba, his servant, had lied about him when he met David before he left Jerusalem. Ziba evidently took all the donkeys himself and prepared this big gift, and he left Mephibosheth without any means of transportation to depart from the city since he was lame. Mephibosheth demonstrates his mourning because he didn't take care of his hygiene, and he expresses his gratitude to David for all of his faithful loving kindness in the past. He says, All my grandfather's descendants deserved nothing but death from my lord the king, but you gave your servant a place among those who sat at your table. So what right do I have to make any more appeals to the king? David hears his heart, and to settle the whole issue, he says to say no more, and he orders Mephibosheth and Ziba to divide the land. But then Mephibosheth puts his focus on the king himself. He says, let Ziba take it all, David. I'm not interested in the land. What matters to me more than anything else in this whole world is that you have come to your own house. All I want is you, not your blessings, not your wealth, not your possessions, but you. Do you look at God this way? Do you come to Jesus for forgiveness because you want to get something out of the deal? Or because the greatest thing you could ever get is a restored relationship with your king? Finally, we see one more person meeting David before he comes back into the land. Barzillai. He is an old man of 80 years who has been faithful and has given supplies to David while he was in the wilderness. And now he has come to see this exciting day of the king returning to his throne. And David invites him to come and join him in Jerusalem where he can repay him. But Barzillai says, no way, David. I'm an old man. I would just get in the way. But here is my servant. Will you treat him like you would treat me? In other words, Barzillai has been so impacted by the king that now he's bringing others to be loved by the king. This is the final step in forgiveness. First, you receive forgiveness. Then you become the kind of person that forgives others and is happy in your restored relationship to God. Then you invite others into this relationship as well. That's the Christian life all summed up in one chapter. But wait there's more. Not everyone is happy. 
it's not all parties and forgiveness and celebration. There are also those who are only out for their own personal game, who seek to stir up trouble, like this worthless man that we see, Sheba. He gathers together the tribes of Israel in rebellion, and I am going to breeze through this because we are already long for today, but Sheba gets this rebellion together, and he marches north through all the territory of Israel, and he makes his camp in a city called Abel, way up in the north. Meanwhile, David calls up his new general, Amasa, and he tells him that he has three days to gather the troops of Judah to go and squash this rebellion. But Amasa is late. So David sends his troops, but he puts Abishai, Joab's brother, in charge. Ouch. David is still a little bit sore about Absalom, but Joab is with him. However, he has been demoted, and he's just a soldier. Joab had disobeyed a direct order, and David is showing him mercy and letting him go into battle at all. But on the way to Abel, to get rid of Sheba, they come across Amasa, and Joab takes out his frustration on him. He kills him. And this is now the third assassination that we've seen Joab commit. Abner, Absalom, and now Amasa. Apparently, Joab has something against people whose name starts with an A. He's not a good guy. But he takes charge of the troops with his brother, and they get to the city to meet this wise woman who yells at them for putting their city under siege. But Joab says, hey, lady, we don't care about your city. We just want this guy Sheba. So she says, "Eh, give me a few minutes. Let me see what I can do. And lo and behold, she organizes the city against Sheba. They execute him and they throw his head over the wall to Joab. To which Joab probably said, ew, thank you. And they all head back to Jerusalem and Joab is in charge of the army once again. A few years pass as David is on the throne and they have famines and more wars with the Philistines and their giants. But we'll have to talk about that another time. The fact of the matter is that David is back on the throne and that he is rapidly approaching the end of his life. He's going to sing us a song about it next time. But in the meantime, I want you to ask yourself what your relationship is to the king. Are you a sworn enemy lost in rebellion? Are you humbled and seeking forgiveness at his feet? Are you walking in daily fellowship with him because you have been forgiven? Are you bringing others into relationship with him. If you'd like to talk about it, I'm here. Connect with me through social media or even an email. You're hanging out with me every day, but this conversation feels kind of lopsided. I'd love to get to know you as a friend. So all of the links are down in the show notes. I look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you for joining me today. I hope this has been encouraging to you. If so, please let me know by visiting the links that you find under the Connect With Us section in the show notes. I'm a simple man and I could use the encouragement. If you've been blessed enough that you would like to support the podcast, I would greatly appreciate that as well. You can go to buymeacoffee.com slash dbrpodcast to make either a one-time gift or to sign up for a monthly recurring membership gift. Until tomorrow, keep reading and keep worshiping.